The evidence is becoming clearer and clearer and is pointing to the idea that SARS-CoV-2, a.k.a. the honey badger virus, is a human-made creation. Looks like it came from a lab. Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Chris Martinson here with your daily update. It is March 4th, 2020. This is day 102. Wow, we broke into the triple digits. And I'm titling this one Lying Virologist and Self-Inflicted Wounds because I'm a little worried that it looks like this was a lab creation. And I'm going to get into some of the data behind that. We did a little of that on Friday. Uh, what was that? May 1st. Um, but here we are. We're going to just finish up with a couple of pieces I didn't quite get to. So if you're a journalist who's investigating this, you're really going to want to listen in closely because I'm going to tell you the questions or even just the question that you should be asking to get to the bottom of this. Uh, but in due respect to the more than three digits now, we broke into the uh, <laughs> into the triple digits for our reporting on this. So guess what? Time to put on a little party hat. Uh, you know what? That's not quite enough. Let's there we go. All right. That feels a lot better to me. Let's move on. Remember, Friday, we talked about this bombshell report in Newsweek uh, talking about how Dr. Fauci had backed controversial, and controversial is a, that's an understatement to me, Wuhan lab with millions of U.S. dollars for risky coronavirus research. Okay, very, very risky. And we talked about the risk of this stuff. This is called gain of function research, where they're effectively taking viruses that lack the ability to infect humans and experimenting on them to see if they can get them to infect more infectiously. Uh, either they're easily, more easily transmissive or have more virulent uh, damaging effects on the body. So that gain of function research was ongoing because ostensibly the idea was, and I, I get it from an intellectual standpoint. First, we'd like to understand the mechanisms of how viruses do what they do. I get that, right? Um, but the second point that they said was, well, you know, we, if one of these things did make this jump that we would sort of monkey with and predict and, and demonstrate could happen in a lab, then we would be able to figure out how to combat it more effectively. Here's the problem. Uh, I haven't found a single paper that talks about how we've gained any knowledge from this that would help us battle this particular virus that came out or any of the other ones. It, it's really, it seems to be the focus is mostly on intellectually, professionally, uh, can we monkey with these viruses and do something with them? But at any rate, the story is now developing this whole idea that came from a lab. We see Mike Pompeo, U.S. Secretary of State, running around now saying enormous evidence the coronavirus came from a Chinese lab. Mm, yeah, and I'm going to, you know, the, the problem is that uh, funding for that Chinese lab came from the U.S. So I'm not sure there's any clean shirts in this particular story. But to understand the science behind this, which is really important to understand, we have to take a little journey down into virology for a second. And really for, you know, it's always been described that the way the COVID-19 virus gets into a cell is it binds to this ACE2 receptor. That's true, but there's it's really a two-step process to gain entry into the cell. Binding that receptor is just the first step. So that's the first thing. Number one, uh, it binds to the receptor. Now, remember, we've already reported this could be ACE2 or it could be this CD147 receptor. ACE2 found all the distributed all through the tissues like we're talking about in this picture down here, well, like we see here. But CD147, that's actually in the, um, uh, it's found all over the place as well, but in particular, it's found in white blood cells and macrophages, things like that. So that's the first thing. You bind to the receptor. Here's the coronavirus. This is one of its S proteins, the spike proteins here. Here it is blowing up. That comes in and binds onto one of these ACE2 receptors. It's this protein subunit binds in and um, clicks onto it. But then a second thing has to happen. The S2 spike protein subunit, S2, the spike protein subunit, needs to be what's called proteolytically snipped or cleaved. And in this case, so... <clears throat> There are uh, various enzymes out there that uh, are very good at cutting proteins, right? So that proteolytic cleaving requires another enzyme to come along. Um, in this case, plasmin. Uh, they're, they're looking at here. Plasmin, its normal job is to take fibrin in a clot and cut it up so that that clot can dissolve. And when it cuts the fibrin, you get these other things called D-dimers, which you've heard me talking about as part of the clotting process, when they see really elevated D-dimer levels in people who have COVID-19, they say, oh my gosh, these people are, are in very bad shape. Um, once the D-dimer levels get up to a certain level, it means there's been lots of clotting, lots of cutting of those clots. But the other thing that plasmin can do now is it can actually cut, make that snip 
in the S2 um, protein subunit of the spike protein, and that allows the RNA to um, fuse with the cell membrane so it can get into the cell. If that SNP doesn't happen, this thing will bind to the, to the receptor, but then it can't get into the cell. So that clip, that proteolytic cut right there, really, really important. And plasmin is, is one, of the, um, uh, one of the things that could do the job. It is one of the uh, protein enzymes out there, but there are many of them. And in fact, we need to talk now about something called furin, which is another one of these. Um, it's a it's a protein cutting protein. It's an enzyme that goes out and snips proteins, and its name is furin. Furin cuts proteins in strictly defined places, so it's a lot of fun to study uh, if you're a virologist or other people who are working with proteins because you can insert a sequence of amino acids, and furin will cut very very defined places in there. Always oh, some pro. Um, some of these uh, proteolytic enzymes, they go out and they cut all over the place. Um, but furin is very, very strict in what it does. And it cuts after this sequence, R, X, X, R. And that is arginine. The R stands for arginine. That's an amino acid. X, X, that could be any amino acid. And then another arginine. So if you see this pattern, R, X, X, R, um, then that's a sequence that furin is going to come along and make a cut there. Moreover, however, even further, if arginine is also in the second or third place, so here it is in the second place right here, here it is in the third place. So if you have this RRXR or RXRR, then the cleavage efficiency is significantly increased, okay? And why is this important? Well, this is the smoking gun in this whole SARS-CoV-2 uh, story here right now. This is the one thing that we need to focus on, the one thing only if we're going to be chasing this down. So uh, this person, by the way, in this medium.com article uh, by Yuri Dagan here, super, I'm going to be drawing on a lot. It's just a fantastic, amazing article that just lays out study after study, piece of data after piece of data, and explains it all in very simple, beautiful terms. So uh, Yuri wrote here, therefore, the appearance of a new furin cleavage site, which was noticed in SARS-CoV-2, there's a brand new site, was noticed immediately as none of the closest or even distant relatives of SARS-CoV-2 have such a site, those coronaviruses that do only share 40% of their genome with CoV-2. So one of the things we're trying to do here when you're trying to figure out, hey, was this natural? Was it man-made? You know, where did it come from? You always have to go with the sequence, how close the sequence of this particular uh, virus is compared to its closest relatives. In an ideal situation, if it did come from nature, we would find a natural virus that has exactly the same sequence as the one that was found in patient zero. Now, remember, patient zero probably was in, in China and probably was there probably November or maybe October, but sometime back there. And that was the first exposure, that patient zero. After that, the virus begins to mutate a little bit. And these are little tiny single nucleotide um, polymorphisms, the SNPs. We talked about those, right? So over time, it will start to mutate a little bit. Most of those mutations mean nothing. They confer nothing new to the virus, except it has a slightly different sequence from the one that came before it. And this is how they're able to track who got it from who, where, when, and all of that stuff, right? So um, that's why in, in a perfect world, if this, if this particular virus did come out of the natural world, in that perfect world, we would know patient zero, and we would also have a natural reservoir, and we would say, hey, look, those are identical. Those are the same sequences. And uh, then the case would be closed. All right. It was found that all spike um, with a SARS-CoV-2 spike sequence homology greater than 40% did not have a furin cleavage site. So this is including this bat cove, the rat TG13 and SARS classic here um, with sequence identity is 97.4% rat TG13. That is the closest one. Uh, SARS cove 78.6% um, homology sequence identity there uh, in the spike proteins. But they found this furin cleavage site RRAR in SARS cove 2. That's RRAR, that a, you can think of that as an X, because that's this right here, R, R, X, R, right there, okay? So a cleavage efficiency is significantly increased. And remember, you need to cleave before you can actually infect. Two-stage infection process. Step one, bind to the receptor. Step two, get cleaved in a specific spot on your protein subunit, allowing 
this conformational change to take place. And then next thing you know, the viral RNA can gain entry into the cell because of that fusion process. All right, the Fern Cleaver site RRAR in SARS-CoV-2 is unique in its family. That's an important sentence right there, is unique in its family. Rendering by its unique insert of PRRA, the furin cleavage site of SARS-CoV-2 is unlikely to have evolved from MERS, HCOV, HQ, HKU1, and so on. From the currently data of currently available sequences and databases, it is difficult for us to find the source. And here the scientists are saying, perhaps there are still many evolutionary intermediate sequences waiting to be discovered, which uh, let me decode that sentence for you. They're throwing their hands up going, uh, there's some, there has to be some magic that happens between the closest relative we know about to SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-2 itself. Uh, there's some magic that happens between there and there. All right, so this is interesting because um, now we're going to tie all this together and then get back into the into the uh, sleuthing a little bit. Because what's interesting, you know, we looked at those clinical risk factors and the clinical observations that said, wow, you know, all these people with right here, hypertension, with diabetes, people with coronary heart disease, cerebrovascular illness, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, kidney dysfunction. These people all have worse clinical outcomes when infected with SARS-CoV-2 for unknown reasons. And by the way, they could have also put um, obesity in here, and that ties into this story very, very tightly, too. The purpose of this review is to summarize the evidence for the existence of elevated plasmin in COVID-19 patients. So plasmin is a one of those proteolytic enzymes that comes out and clips proteins, right? We talked about that, and it clips fibrin and creates those D-dimers. All right. Plasmin and other proteases may cleave a newly inserted furin site in the S protein of SARS-CoV-2 extracellularly, which increases its infectivity and virulence. Hyperfibrinolysis associated with plasmin leads to elevated D-dimer in severe patients. The plasminogen system may prove a promising therapeutic target for combating COVID-19. So they've already noted clinically that this uh, this extra uh, cleavage site is conferring, uh, ties in very tightly with these um, uh, particular outcomes in the clinic. And by the way, people who have these various conditions tend to have elevated levels of plasmin and plasminogen in their blood. So this is beginning to tie together pretty nicely. Extracellular cleavage of virus envelope fusion glycoproteins by host cellular proteases is a prerequisite for the infectivity of respiratory viruses. And by the way, we've known that for a long time, decades now, okay? The presence of a polybasic cleavage site. It's polybasic, so the arginine is a basic amino acid. So um, that RRXR, that's what they mean by polybasic. Many basic pieces together, RRXR. Uh, that can be cleaved by furin-like proteases is a signature of several highly pathogenic avian influenza viruses. Oh, and by the way, have humans been monkeying around with avian influenza viruses inserting uh, these polybasic cleavage sites to experiment? Yes, we have. Similarly, the S protein of SARS-CoV-2 harbors a furin cleavage site at the S1, S2 boundary. That's the sub subunit one, subunit two of the spike protein. And... Um, we talked about that just a second ago. The almost ubiquitous and diverse expression of furin-like proteases could lead to increasing SARS-CoV-2 cell and tissue tropism and transmissibility and enhance its pathogenicity. Um, all right. So the clinicians are starting to weigh in and they're starting to look at this. So let's look back at COVID-19 because we got to, this is, this is the smoking gun part of the story here. So let's look here. Um, by the way, sorry, this is kind of small here, but this is a, a table pulled from uh, a study that was looking at SARS-CoV-2 here at the top, right? And it's, here are all these other coronaviruses that it could be related to, okay? And it's, here's its identity. Here's how close its spike protein is. So SARS-CoV-2 is 100% identical with itself. So that's a good, good thing to find, right? Its next nearest relative is uh, the rat TG13. It has 97.4% similarity in the spike protein, but this is its furin score, okay, which is anything over 0.5, it says, means that it's furin cleavable. So SARS-CoV-2 has a 0.62. Its nearest relative on its family tree, if we want to look at it that way, only has a score of 0.15. And then down here at 80%, you have one with 0.17. 
Here's one at 76%. So we're getting really far down the family tree. 0.117. Oh my gosh, you jump all the way down to only 37% identity here with the um, HKU5. And here the furin score jumps back up to 0.697. Here's MERS itself at 0.563, but only a 35% identity. Um, Rat Cove here, uh, 87.879 on the furin score, but only 36% uh, identity. So here's the thing. No nearby relative. Whoops. God, why doesn't that pick that? There we go. No nearby relative has a furin score that's useful. These are all not um, they don't have fur and cleavage sites. These do. These all have really tasty fur and cleavage sites, but none of them are more than 40%. In fact, 37 is the highest. So none of them are more than 38% similar to the one in question, COVID-19. So that is a big, big deal. It means that this thing somehow magically all of a sudden got itself a fur and cleavage site, which we can't see anywhere on this family tree. This is a little hard to interpret. Here's another way I saw it put. I like looking at it this way. And what we're looking at here is uh, these, the pink means that this, uh, these, uh, what do, how do I, let me back up here. Um, these are all coronaviruses. And these are, this is a coronavirus family tree right here. And you could think of each one of these as you come out this tree, these two would be very closely related to each other. These two little things right here, you, I, I can't even see them. So if it's blurry for you, don't worry about it. But you'd come all the way out here, and there, here, this is a big tree right here. And then we have to jump all the way over, and there's another tree right there. And you come all the way out here to another big family tree, and then here. You can think of each of these as like um, grandparents. That's great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, great-great-great. The This is really, really far genetically, getting further and further apart genetically. All right. So this is a genetic wheel, and it shows how close these things are. So these are all closer to each other, and by the time you're over here, you're really far away from these, and so on. The pink ones, anything in this pink part here, these have uh, furin cleavage sites in their sequence. And the ones in yellow have no furin cleavage sites anywhere in their sequence, okay? And here's the punchline to this. This is SARS-CoV-2 right here, and here it is with its own little tiny wedge way out in the middle of a whole lot of yellow. It doesn't have anybody related to it anywhere close in its family tree that has this furin-specific cleavage site. It's just parked all out there all by itself. And you have to go back many generations, many, many generations. You have to come all the way back to here to come down this spoke of the wheel um, in order to find anything close to it. So uh, that's really, that's quite an oddity. Normally, the way these things would go is that you would find that um, uh, everybody's pretty closely related. And if you wanted to see uh, how this got its fur and cleavage site, you would just trace back and you'd come back down another one. Like you could do that here, like oh, up and down like that, right? We're still in the in the pink part of this wheel. So at any rate, real mystery uh, just presented uh, by these people like, yeah, look, there it is uh, lurking all by itself way out there, SARS-CoV-2. And um, uh Let's see, where do I want to go with this next? Yeah, you know, okay, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll we'll go this way. Um, yeah, we'll do this. All right, so this is comparing the actual genetic sequences. Here's the rat TG, not that one. Let's get the other one out. Rat TG13, here's SARS-CoV-2, right? And here's pangolin, uh, the M789. That's one of the closest uh, relatives. So you've heard big prominent virologists, Michael Olsterholm and, and um, uh, all these uh, people who are in that nature paper. I'm going to pull back up again, all saying, oh, you know, looks like it came out of a bat, but maybe it had some time in a pangolin. Um, one thing I want to have you look at here is just how close these all are, except here's that PRRA sequence right here. And it exists in SARS-CoV-2, but it's com not just... This isn't a mutation. It is completely missing. That's what these dots mean. It's completely missing. So now we have to talk about something that's really important that is part of this smoking gun story. The difference between a mutation and an insert. So this is the genetic string of RNA going along. And this is actually from the pangolin right here that, that I pulled out. And this is a, 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 a mutation right here where instead of a T, there's a G here. And because of that, you will get a different amino acid. Why does this pick so badly? There. 
Because of this, you will get a different amino acid out of this. So these are red and threes. So this is the way cellular machinery works. These three RNA chunks will, will be read by a ribosome. It'll come along. It'll look at all three of those together, CAA, and it'll give you an amino acid because CAA confers a specific amino acid. And here's another one. ACT is another three-letter combo that gives and codes for a very specific amino acid. It reads along. AAT gives you another one. TCA and all of that. And so we're just going along like this. They're exactly identical, right? They're exactly identical here um, in this sequence right here. I'm reading this sequence right here until you get here. And then all of a sudden this G is different from that T right there. Okay. So that T and that G are different. And that's what an insert is. These mutations, I'm sorry, uh, sort of mutation is these mutations are fairly common. They happen pretty often. What doesn't happen all that often is you get this giant insert where there are 12 new base pairs in here, um, uh, nucleotides in here, not base pairs. I'm sorry, I get my DNA mixed up. This is a single-stranded RNA. So this is just 12 nucleotides, CCT, GCC, CGG, CGA. That gives us our PRRA. Um, this, this sequence right here gives us that polybasic furin cleavage site all right and here's what's interesting remember we talked about um uh and again this is a note to journalists you just want to remember this is prra you, you just want to get this we talked about this article that came out here the proximal origin of sars cov 2 we had uh robert gary in here we had lipkin we had uh anderson here and they came out with this um uh you know big giant study that came out in nature or or a letter that they wrote in and says, um, we offer a perspective on notable features of SARS-CoV-2 genome and discuss scenarios by which they could have arisen. Our analyses clearly show that SARS-CoV-2 is not a laboratory construct or a purposely manipulated virus. So that's what they came up with. In there, they did push out, and I'll just drag this up here and uh, send this to the, bring it to the front here. All right. They did put out here, though, they showed us here SARS-CoV-2 compared to the rat TG-13, and they even noted that there's this big gap here where you have this PRRA sequence that somehow magically got inserted into SARS-CoV-2. Not a mutation, right? They even pull up, hey, pangolin, right? It's missing that sequence. Rat TG-13 is missing this sequence here, right? Um, and... Uh, Human SARS itself, classic SARS, missing this sequence here. Bat, SARS correlated, missing this sequence here. So these, this is a really important finding. And because of this is a really important finding, mutations happen all the time. But when you have an insert, when you have a whole insert, that's kind of the thing that humans would do. They would put a whole insert in there. And you have to explain where that insert came from because uh, whole inserts are not part of the mutation pathway. Uh, that's a whole different process of how things get inserted, all right? So if I'm the journalist, you ask this question and you ask about the PRA and nothing else. So let's look at the, they only mentioned furin four times in this article by these world-leading experts on virology saying that this thing is completely natural. Well, the sudden appearance way out on a family tree, which has, and by the way, virologists all know this stuff, right? I mean, I had to go learn this stuff, but presumably they're all... Up the, up the curve on this, for it to suddenly have this thing way out here and all alone on its family tree have this um, uh, furin cleavage site, you'd think that would be important. Well, they only mentioned the word furin four times in this entire multi-page uh, article here on the proximal origin of SARS-CoV-2, and here's what they finally said. They said the functional consequence of the polybasic cleavage site in SARS-CoV-2 is unknown. Wait a minute. What do you mean it's unknown? The functional consequence of a polybasic cleavage site is highly very very well known and i'm going to show you how well known it is so that's not that's dissembling that's not true uh the functional consequence of polybasic cleavage sites is it allows sars-cov-2 to be a lot deadlier and a lot a uh, lot more able to uh enter into the cells okay and it will be important to determine its impact on transmissibility and pathogenesis and animal models so here's the weasel wording they're just like well uh, listen, we know that polybasic cleavage sites are really important in other viruses, but we haven't proven it yet in uh, in animal models, so we can't really say. So they say it's unknown. But um, if you asked a virologist uh, what what the what that would confer, they would uh, I think they'd pretty much tell you what would happen. 
uh, which is nothing good. Experiments with SARS-CoV, that's classic SARS, have shown that insertion of a fur and cleavage site at the S1-S2 junction enhances cell-cell fusion without affecting viral entry. In addition, efficient cleavage of the MERS-CoV spike enables MERS-like coronaviruses from bats to infect human cells. Huh. Well, here there's so I guess they're saying in classic SARS, somebody inserted a fur and cleavage site at the S1-S2 junction, and it didn't really help all that much. Um, but in uh, MERS-CoV, it clearly uh, enables uh, coronaviruses from bats to infect human cells. All right. Let's let's go here. Um, um, nah, I'm going to go here first. I'm going to come back to that. All right. So check this out. Uh, so have, have people been um, monkeying around with this? Yeah. So check this out. Uh, the closest relative uh, is, of SARS-CoV-2 with a furin site is the HKU5 strain. This was isolated by who? Oh, Batwoman back in uh, 2014 in Guangzhou from bats. Uh, but it is a very distant relative. Their spike proteins only share 36%. So the virologists are puzzled. Where did this 12 nucleotide insert come from? Could it be lab mate? Well, virologists have studied furin sites in coronaviruses for decades and have in introduced many artificial ones in the lab. For example, an American team inserted RRSRR into the spike protein of the first car, SARS CoV, back in 2006. So they investigated whether proteolytic cleavage at the basic amino acid residues were to occur might facilitate cell-cell fusion entry. We mutated the wild-type SARS glycoprotein to construct a polyprototypic furin recognition site, RRRR, at either position. So, hey, uh, Americans did this back in um, 2006, right? They inserted these things. Um, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think they should. And, uh, and again, in 2008, the Japanese inserted RRKR into SARS-CoV protein in 2008. Um, and so, so they did that. Um, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. And again, and again, in 2008, Dutch colleagues also studied how these protease sites of SARS-CoV and compared them to the murine coronavirus, which has a site like this, right? Which again is a polybasic site, quite similar to... That of COVE-2. Look how close those are. S-P-S-R-R-A-H-R, -R -R -R, and this is S-P-R-R-A-R, -R -R, right? So very close. Uh, and in 2009, another American group also working on improving SARS-CoV, classic SARS-CoV, and continuing the American tradition of not penny pitching on arginines, they inserted as many as four of them, R-R-S-R-R. -R -R -R. So have humans been uh, putting these polybasic cleavage sites into viruses to study the how those uh, influence uh, viro the, the viricity of these things, right? The, the ability for them to both transmit and then infect um, in, into the cells. Yes, yes. It's a huge, huge uh, line of research that's been going on for a very, very long time. But your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. And finally, again, um, again from this wonderful thing in Medium um, by uh, Yuri Dagan here. In uh, Beijing, 2019, but the most recent work of this kind that I came across, he writes, was an October 2019 paper, October 2019, from several Beijing labs where the new furin site RRKR was inserted not into not just some pseudovirus, but into an actual live chicken coronavirus infectious bronchitis virus. There they are inserting it. So this kind of stuff has been going on for a long time. And it's that cleavage site right here that allows that SNP to happen so that we can get that second action happening so that this thing comes in and the membranes fuse and that confers um, so much of the, of the terrible, awful nature of this particular virus. So it was odd to me then to see on the Joe Rogan experience on March 10th, one of the leading virologists in the United States, Michael Olsterholm, came on. And uh, was asked by Joe, you know, is there any chance this thing came out of a lab? And um, and uh, uh, Michael gave an answer where he said, um, uh, man-made diseases, that's exactly, I mean, you know, uh, we could not have crafted a virus like this to do what it's doing. I mean, we don't have the creative imagination or the skill set. Um, yeah, we do. Uh, we got the skill set. Uh, yep. Yep. Uh, there it is. 
Yeah. Okay. So we've been monkeying around with this stuff for a long time. Michael knows this better than anybody. He's one of the leading virologists out there. So that's kind of dissembling on his part. And further, he said, well, you know, and this thing, you know, it looks like it comes from a pangolin probably. It's really close to a pangolin. And of course, Michael would know that it's close to a pangolin, but it's missing a polybasic furin cleavage site, P-R-R-A. So if you're a journalist out there, this is the smoking gun. This is the number one thing you want to find out. Where did this insert come from? And you would be well to know that these sorts of inserts have been monkeyed with over and over and over again by scientists seeking to understand how viruses do what they do. And by the way, they have a two-step process for step one, bind the receptor. Step two, get proteolytically cleaved so that you can undergo a fusion process so your RNA as a virus gets dumped into the host cell so it can replicate. All right, and clearly, clearly... You know, he says, ah, we don't have the skill set. Clearly, we have these capabilities because here's a group. Uh, this just came out uh, today, actually. Yep, May 4th, uh, that says, oh, hey, that whole thing, the SARS-CoV-2, you know what? You know what they did? They used a synthetic genomics platform, and only a week after receipt of the synthetic, synthetic DNA fragments, you know what they did? They were able to engineer and resurrect chemically synthesized clones of the recent epidemic SARS-CoV-2. The technical advance we describe here allows a rapidly response, allows a rapid response to emerging viruses. I'm going to edit for them here. As it enables the generation and functional characterization of evolving RNA virus variants in real time during an outbreak. So they were able to, uh, using an artificial uh, yeast uh, model, they were able to generate infectious RNA to rescue viable virus. They rebuilt the virus out of fragments. So to say, you know, we just don't have the skill sets for this stuff, not true, um, because we actually do have that. And remember, you look at this and you say, oh, my God, there are people who who are able to recreate this virus from scratch, in essence, uh, just having the sequence. Uh, I'm not so sure I feel comfortable having that information out in the world. Uh, because it, obviously it could be used by the wrong people in, in the wrong way. And remember... But your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. All right. And I think we're getting a real circling of the wagons here as well. Um, in this one, in April 20th, we have scientists are tired of explaining why the COVID-19 virus was not made in a lab. Um, this is in sciencealert.com. It's a rumor that just won't die, they write in an exasperated tone of voice here. When asked whether COVID-19 virus was genetically engineered in a lab, scientists have already said no rather firmly, but the matter of the new coronavirus's origin is unlikely to be put to rest so easily. Back in late March, we covered a study published in Nature Medicine in which the researchers investigated the genomic data of SARS-CoV-2, particularly the receptor binding domain sections of the virus, to try and discover how it mutated into the virulent and deadly version we're currently struggling to contain. Well, that's easy. It's got a, got a polybasic fern cleavage site added to it. That's how it's so bad. As a byproduct of the research, they were able to determine that SARS-CoV-2 was not genetically manipulated. Now, how could that be? How can you determine that? So you can't actually say that. You want to know why? Because you look at uh, certain technologies like this, and um, there are people who are in labs that have created entire genomes of various viruses without any signatures and like you know like there's a digital thumbprint that you might be able to find you know if you're doing computer forensics well what you would want to see is it is there some specific sequence of nucleotides that if you saw that it would say that oh they were using a certain plasmid or a certain technology or there was a certain snip and tuck nope they have fully 100 percent recreated some labs have been able to fully recreate viruses with no alterations just 100 percent the genome that you see without any uh, telltale fingerprints uh, going on in there. So you can't, you cannot actually determine it was not genetically manipulated just by looking at the genome. Um, and uh, so this is, this is crap what they're saying right here, pure crap. By comparing the available genome sequence data for known coronavirus strains, we can firmly determine that SARS-CoV-2 originated through natural processes. One of the researchers, oh, immunist Christian Anderson, Christian Anderson. Um, Christian Anderson. Oh, yeah, there we go. So uh, you write the paper that proves that uh, this, you know, proves, air quotes, proves that this thing uh, came from a natural origin. And then uh, later you get quoted and uh, you, you say, uh, um, <laughs> you quote yourself, I guess. 
Uh, but here's the thing. Comparing available genome sequence data to that of known coronavirus strains, how can you firmly determine this came through natural processes? Because when we do that, when we actually look at the genomic data, what do we find? We find that there's SARS-CoV-2 all by itself, way out here, all on it in its own family tree, you know, with uh, nothing that we can show for it here to show how, like, what, what, how... I don't even understand how that virologist can say that definitively and say, looking at known genomes, we can confidently say this thing's natural origin. Really? Where did it get that polybasic fur and cleavage site from? Not from its neighbors, not from any of its closest relatives. So that's a little bit of a hop, skip, and a jump, don't you think? At least enough where you have to soften that and you can't be this declarative. It's this level of declaration here. By comparing available genome sequence data for known coronavirus strains, we can firmly determine that SARS-CoV-2 originated through natural processes. Huh. Hmm. I'm not sure how you do that because you can't look at the genome sequence data I've got and say anything except, wow, it's really weird that this thing somehow came up with its own fur and cleavage site way over here all on its own. Two features of the virus, the mutations in the receptor binding domain portion of the spike protein and its distinct backbone rules out laboratory manipulation as potential origin for SARS-CoV-2. This is the whole, oh, uh, it's too complex for a computer to have created it, so it can't have been done. And then they continue on. Look at this declarative language here. Although it is clear, now that we've established that, that the virus was not created in the lab, there have been ongoing concerns that may have escaped a research facility, with most of the speculation understandably focused on the Wuhan Institute of Virology. However, just remains speculation. The Washington Post recently reported the U.S. Embassy officials had safety concerns about the lab back in 2018, and the Institute did keep a closely related bat virus, but even that's far from a smoking gun. No, you know what the smoking gun is? P-R-R-A. It's that polybasic furin cleavage site, which somehow came out of nowhere on the family tree and was just parked in there. And oh, by the way, just happens to be the place that all these gain-of-function virologists monkey with all the time because it's a well-known fact for both um, many of the influenza viruses as well as the coronaviruses that you need to have that site. And if you can do, if you can put that site in in just the right spot in the spike protein, especially the S2, that you give and you confer massive gain-of-function on that particular virus. So I would say, even though I'm not a world-leading virologist, that I can't look at this wheel and say that there's any case to be made for uh, the genetic sequence of this supporting the idea that it has a close relative that we can look at where it got that polybasic furin cleavage site. And again, this is an insert, not a mutation. If it was a simple case of, well, two or three mutations and we got here and this one was close, all right, I, I could buy that. We don't have that. We've got a giant insert in here um, that's uh, that gives this thing uh, its gain of function. That's really, really bad ass. All right. Conclusions for today. The press needs to ask one question, one question only. Don't be distracted by all of this complicated, oh, we've run huge computational simulations. Oh, my gosh, our, our, our genetic blah, blah, blah. No, here's your question. You ready for this, journalist? How did that polybasic furin cleavage site, PRRA, get into COVID-19? Full stop. As soon as you answer that, effectively, we can move on to the next set of questions I've got, but that's it. Let's just start, if we could just focus on that. How did that cleavage site get into COVID-19, right? That's the important question. And I'm super disappointed with the dissembling, and I think what even amounts to overt lying and cover your A behavior, a CYA behavior of what appears to be a significant portion of the U.S. virology community. Um, and, and, and just to, just to, yeah, I skipped over. Let me go back to this. This is Francis Collins, director of the of National Institute of Health, right? March 26th. Look, look at this stuff. No matter where you go online these days, there's bound to be discussion of coronavirus disease. Some folks are even making outrageous claims that the new coronavirus causing the pandemic was engineered in a lab and deliberately released to make people sick. Well, I see you made a jump there. I wouldn't have made. I don't know if it was deliberately released or not. Beats me. Um so, you know, let's not conflate those two things. So I think that's 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 some sophistry right there. It's like, oh, you believe it was engineered, then you also must believe it was deliberately released. No, 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 back up. Separate concepts, separate concepts. Um, this one requires speculation as to intent. This one, engineered, just requires us to look at the available data and ask some 
questions from which we can deduce certain things. So let's not put those two together. A new study debunks such claims by providing scientific evidence that this novel coronavirus rose at and rose naturally. Oh, I wonder what study that could be. The reassuring findings whew, are the result of genomic analysis conducted by an international research team partly supported by NIH. Oh, there's the conflict right there. In their study in the journal Nature Medicine, Christian Anderson, Scripps Research Institute of La Jolla, California, Robert Gary, and their colleagues use sophisticated bioinformatic tools to compare publicly available genomic data from several coronaviruses, including the new one that causes COVID-19. Certainly sounds very authoritative. The researchers began by homing in on the parts of the coronavirus genomes that encode the, encode the spike proteins that give this family of viruses their distinctive crown-like appearance. All coronaviruses rely on these spike proteins to infect other cells, but blah, 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 blah. Look at this. So here's... Uh, uh, the director of the NIH coming out and citing this same study here, the one that just skipped right over PRRA, gave it a little bit of short shrift over here, and then just wandered off into its conclusion territory, which was, uh, you know, this thing is uh, uh, guaranteed came from natural place, came from a natural setting. <laughs> it was not purposely manipulated. You can't actually deduce that from the genomic sequence because, again, you can, there are ways to... Uh, to take the genomic sequence of viruses and completely manufacture them from scratch and not leave a single fingerprint. So you can't actually look at the genetic sequence and say squat about it, um, as far as I understand it. All right. Uh, so this dissembling overlying CYA behavior, you know, uh, of the of these people, I would feel better if these virologists in the United States would say something more honest, like, hey, this looks really bad. I'm a little bit worried. I got to be honest, my whole career, my reputation, my paycheck we're all kind of dependent on this research continuing. And uh, listen, here's what we know for sure. And here's what we don't know for sure. Um, listen, we can't ever say for sure whether something has been monkeyed with or not, because the way the technology has progressed at this point in time, you could recreate an entire um, uh, virus from scratch and not leave a single fingerprint. So we can't be sure based on looking at the sequence as well. Secondarily, when we look at this, we admit there's a big jump there. How this got this 12... Uh, nucleotide insert in there, which conferred magically um, a polybasic fur and cleavage site. That's a mystery too. You know, what would really be best is if we could go out and find a, a natural virus that actually mirrors this one perfectly um, or close enough that we could say we got there. And by the way, everything that's kind of close, the rat TG13, the pangolin, everything we can find that's sort of close, none of them have that fur and cleavage site. You know, the kinds we've been monkeying with as gain of function researchers all these years. I know it looks bad, but here's why I happen to think that that this is actually natural, right? Okay, that would be great. So all, I, and I don't want to cast aspersions on on the entire virology community. I'm saying at least those who have been monkeying with gain of function research, they seem to be the ones who are most interested in coming out and muddying the waters right now. And by the way, both the U.S. and China up to their virologist eyeballs in this story. And again, not virologists, the gain of function virologist eyeballs. I don't. I mean, I'm yes. Yeah, let's just be clear. That seems to be a, a fairly small club that um, were involved in this stuff at this point. And by the way, these sorts of studies should never have been done. The things we could have learned from them was tiny compared to the amount of damage that could be done by this. And if this turns out to have been a gain-of-function research experiment that went bad, whether it was released deliberately, accidentally, unintentionally, intentionally, it doesn't matter. It happened. And if that's the case and that's the story, there's a lot that has to be answered for because this has been one of the most destructive economic events of anybody's lifetime and that should have been a foreseen consequence somebody should have been asking that question hey what if one of these things got out you know and uh, the fact that they didn't ask that question or answer it appropriately and, and meaning they still decide to go ahead with it however you look at it um this is uh this is now out of the bag so that's that's as far as i'm gonna go uh with this story i think i think i don't have to go much further than that um to me this is the one thing I would focus on. I wouldn't get um, PRRA. I, I wouldn't get uh, too wrapped up in anything else about this at this point in time. And um, until that question is answered, I, I'm going to have to fall very heavily on the side of believing that this was an intentional insertion of a polybasic uh, fur and cleavage site in order to explore and unravel the mysteries of how a virus penetrates a cell. I think it was a gain-of-function research experiment that was both successful 
and then unsuccessful because of because of what happened next. So that's all I've got on that for today. Remember, plant a garden. I just don't think we're getting out of the um, woods on this particular virus anytime soon. Uh, it's got a lot of tricks up its sleeve, and that's the problem is that 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 particular fur and cleavage site that it has. One of the reasons it's so bad, so badass, is because. Um, there are both intracellular, meaning inside the cell, and extracellular out in the bloodstream and in the lymphatic tissues. There are proteases existing both inside and outside of cells that can help activate this virus. So that means that it, it's uh, really, really particularly good at um, infecting people and getting inside our cells and doing a lot of damage. And by the way, with both ACE2 and CD147 receptors, it has a lot of different places that it can attack inside the body. That's what makes it particularly bad. And that's why we shouldn't have been monkeying around with these sorts of viruses in this particular way. Very bad idea. And uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to live with the consequences of that if the story as I've turned uh, laid it out turns out to be true. All right. Thank you for listening. And uh, we'll be back tomorrow. Bye.